out of the sky right now is the same water that fell out of the sky yesterday? Well, it might not be the exact same water that fell out of the sky yesterday, but this water has definitely fallen from the sky before. How long ago? When was it made? That's exactly it. It was made trillions of years ago, and all the water around us is the same water that has been around for trillions of years. It's the same water that the dinosaurs drank. Ew! So this rain could have been dinosaur spit? Absolutely! Don't you kids have enough sense to come out of that rain? Now I know you've heard about the unicycle and the motorcycle the bicycle and the tricycle. But have you ever heard about the water cycle? Well, one day I tried to ride my bike into the lake outside. I pedaled my hardest but couldn't tread.
whenever you're ready, countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. of matter, air pressure, extreme weather, ah. meteorology, predictions, and weather tools. In fact, we have a special guest, a meteorologist, who's going to share with us here today. So we are so excited to be back on the stage for Science Saturdays, all about weather. That's right. Well, let's get started right away. So we have two words of the day that have a lot to do with weather, okay? They are expansion and... Contraction. Expansion is the process of molecules moving further apart. So as you can see, here's some molecules in this beaker. These look like they might be water molecules, H2O, um, and they're moving further apart. And when molecules move further apart, sometimes they change states or they evaporate. And so when they move further apart, when we say the word expansion, we want you to go like this. Give me some space. That's good. Ready? Expansion. Give me some space. You say it. Expansion. Give me some space. Or even if I say expanding. Give, give me, me some, some space. space. Any form of the word expansion. Give me some space. You need to be saying give me some space. And what's the other word, Fulty? All right. Our next word is contraction. So if expansion is contraction, or expansion is give me some space, contraction is going to be moving closer together is the opposite so molecules moving closer together when you think about a solid a solid is dense the molecules are going to be compacted they're going to be closer together they're contracting closer together so when we say contraction you're gonna sing a little bit of this song everybody get together and you start clapping when you say every okay everybody get together so Contraction. Everybody get together. Contraction. Everybody get together. So if you hear us say contraction. Everybody get together. All right, we got to get that clapping together. <laughs> but, or any form of that word, like contracting. Everybody get together. Right? If you start clapping when you sing it, it'll be right. Everybody get together. That's great. All right. Those are our words. Listen for them. We're going to start with the states of matter. And we're going to come over here, and I have one state of matter down in this cooler here. All right. I'm going to reach in here. Hmm. Ooh, what might be in a cooler? Hmm. Hmm. Look at this. It's cold. It's a solid. What is it? Ice. And ice is made of water. As a matter of fact, there's some water starting to, starting to form in the state we normally see it in the bottom of this bag. It's a liquid state because it's heating up. It's expanding. 
Give me some space. Right? So this is solid right now. It's hard. If I throw it at you and, you, and it hits you, then you can feel it. It's like hail. It got you on the head. Are you okay? All right, good. All right. So this is one state of matter called a solid. Let's go ahead and bring that graphic up, Abby. There's a graphic for solid uh, liquid and gas. So as you can see, there's a temperature line across the bottom. My hand is getting very cold because the low temperature is causing this water to be a solid. All of the molecules in this water are contracting. Together. Right? And it's melting in my hand a little bit because they're expanding. Give me some space. Good. You guys are really good at this part. Yeah, my hand is getting so cold because all the heat is being drawn out. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put a bunch of ice here into this bowl. And we're going to measure the temperature of it. What do you think is the temperature of water when it is a solid like ice? Somebody in the back knows. What do you think? You had your hand up back there. What do you think? What's the temperature? 32 degrees what? Fahrenheit. Does anybody know what it is in Celsius? Yes. Zero. Okay. The whole reason that the Celsius scale was created was to measure the freezing point and the boiling point of water. All right. So zero degrees is one end of that. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn this butane heater on here. And our poor temperature probe is not staying on again. This happened during our rehearsal. I hope it wants to stay on today. Oh, it's not. But it is on. It is connected to our phone. Oh, our so app, it works even though, even though the screen And it will is... continue to work. Okay, okay, good. So, um, Abby, why don't you show them what that looks like on our phone right now? We're hoping to go from a solid to a liquid to a gas as we heat this and the molecules inside expand. Give me some space. Good. You can see our graph there. It's right there around zero. Okay. It made a couple bumps there because it's trying to figure out, it's trying to adjust itself. But as you can see throughout time, and this is what I use when I'm grilling some good meat at home. Mm. Getting hungry. I use this to determine the temperature of the meat. And so we're using it just to make a nice graphic for you. And hopefully we'll watch this temperature rise. We're going to let that go. And we're going to go over here and do another experiment really a demonstration. Now, in those water molecules there, the reason they're expanding is that they're, they're gaining heat, okay? The heat is being transferred to them, and those molecules are expanding. Give me some space. And becoming liquid, and then they'll become a gas later on. What we're going to do here is show you kind of how hot air balloons work. Uh, where's a slur slide for that, too? She's working on something else right now, but... The way that hot air balloons work is, uh, have you, anybody ever seen a hot air balloon launch? All right, I had the treat this summer of seeing it. I was just at a camp, and then right next to the camp, they started launching a hot air balloon. So we just gave up all the plans and we watched that because it was great. What they did is they put this huge fiery heater right at the bottom of the balloon and it expanded. Give me some space. So today, our um, heat source is gonna be this toaster. Sorry, honey, I, that you couldn't have your bagels this morning because I took the, did you know that I took the toaster? Okay, all right. All right, so I'm going to, oh, I'm going to turn on the toaster. All right. All right. Then I'm going to put this around my around toaster, my being careful not to let it come in contact with it. I don't want to catch this paper on fire. And what's going to happen, I went to the dry cleaners. They were very nice. I said, you know, you walk into a dry cleaner, and you're like, hi, I do a science show. Can I have a bag that goes over a garment? And they're like, sure. So that's a fun thing to try someday. All right. All right. So here we have a big plastic garment bag that goes over a dress that you might have had at the dry cleaners. And as you can start to see, the air molecules are going to start expanding inside of this bag. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, the bag, the bag is contracted. Everybody get together. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll work on that uh, for the next one. All right. Oh, look at that. You can see it's starting to, it's starting to expand. So what's happening here? Thank you. Nice. There's air molecules in here, right? And they're being heated up by this toaster, which is our heat source. And it's starting to expand. Give me some space. And it's causing what's called a high pressure system. That's related to weather. 
okay? The high pressure, high pressure always, always wants, wants to move to, to an move area, to of, area low of low pressure. And as you can and see, you can we've, got we've got molecules on the inside, on the inside expanding. expanding. Give me some space. And the cooler, denser air on the outside is contracted. Everybody get together. All right, that was, right, that was better. And then what's going to happen pretty soon is then when this gets equalized, when there's enough hot air molecules expanding and pushing out on this bag, thank you, then it should float away. And we have such a grand space for this to work in. I'm hoping it touches the ceiling. We'll find out. How's our, how's our water looking over there? I think we're about at 24 degrees. All right, let's switch over to that real quick, Abby, if we can. Let's see what the, uh, the temperature gauge says. Oh, this is getting close. Look at that. <laughs> it's a little bit up and down. I think maybe our thermometer took a dip there. When the, when the ice got um, turned into a liquid because the molecules expanded, Give me some space. then it probably made that, that that, uh, that probe touched the bottom where yeah, there is more ice. But as you can see, it's increasing and increasing all the way up to that red line of 100 because 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point. Oh, oh here goes. we go. Woo. And then all the hot air wants to come out. There, all the hot air came out. You got it? All right, cool. You want to bring that? Thank you. Wasn't that fun? And so that's the way, thank you, the hot air balloons work, except they try to really try to make sure it's balanced so that it doesn't go like that, right? And they have lots of technology to make that happen. All right, well, next, how's that going? Are we ready to check in on that yet? Or? It's still about 35 that's degrees. Right. Okay, so we're still, we're still increasing Steadily the temperature. Steadily increasing. Let's move on to our next slide, all about what's called the Coriolis effect, okay? The Coriolis effect can be seen in hurricanes. Everybody tracking Ida recently? Like you saw that big hurricane, right, that came across? It actually did a whole lot more damage to humans on the East Coast with tornadoes and things. It caused a lot of extreme weather. So we're gonna show you an image of Coriolis effect in just a second. Oh wait, wait, I forgot. There's one more state of matter I added. Did you know, like you studied in school, there's three states of matter, right? Solid, liquid, gas. But there's another one called plasma beyond that. When things get so, 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 so hot, that the electrons actually get ripped off of the atoms in those things, then it's called plasma. It's a state of matter called plasma. And it's the stuff that lightning is made out of, all right? All right. So the Coriolis effect, as you can see, we have the, where we live here in the northern hemisphere. Uh, oh, my shadow's not tall enough. All the way up there, you see the effect of something looking like it's turning in a counterclockwise or against the clock, right? Counterclockwise, like a backwards clock. In the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, you can see like where Australia and South America are. You can see it's, it turns in a clockwise direction. And that's because of this thing called the Coriolis effect. And it's just an illusion based on where we are and what we can see. So because the Earth is turning, uh, well, not because the Earth is turning, let me back up. So high pressure wants to move to low pressure like we saw with a hot air balloon, right? It's, all the molecules are really spreading out and expanding. But they want to move to an area where molecules are more contracted. Everybody get together. All right, so they are moving from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. And when they do that, they go in a straight line. But it looks like it's turning because the Earth is turning. So imagine I start moving across the Earth. But then by the time I get to the part where I want to land, the Earth has turned. So it looks like I've curved. So we've built a large scale model to demonstrate this today, okay? We're gonna have two uh, pre-chosen volunteers in the audience come out, all right? Because we had to try this before the show. All right, so this is Kate and Ben. Say hello, Kate and Ben. All right, they're actually brother and sister. They cooperate so well, watch. All right, go ahead and get on here. I'm gonna load them up, get them on here. Is the camera all connected and everything? Okay, are we balanced? Oh, 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 Kate, move up a little bit. There, oh, can't Back. move up a little bit more. Oh, there, that way, okay. Okay. Nope. Pretty balanced, okay? Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin them, see? Right, they get to spin on here. All right, we're gonna do that in just a minute. But first, we're gonna install this GoPro. All right, there's, see, there's GoPro on these poles. 
My friend Tommy, who's an engineer, built this system for us. He was so kind. I'm going to put this in here. And as you can see, there's a shadow of our system on the screen. But from the camera, if we turn it, let's go ahead and turn that. Sometimes the camera takes a minute to catch up to it. Is it live? All right. Well, it's not coming onto the screen somehow. Anyway, I hope we can see it on the screen eventually. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this ball here, and we're going to let Kate throw it over to Ben. They're going to play a little game of catch. This is what they do naturally at home, right? They just play catch in the living room like this. They stay off of their mobile devices, um, and they don't do any homework, and they just do this all day. And yeah, <laughs> I, I'm being sarcastic. All right, so I wish we could see this. Um, is there a way to maybe switch and switch back? Let's see, let's see. Still not live. Boo. Well, maybe we can at least give you the playback because we're going to record it from the GoPro and maybe we can play that back. But for some reason, we just got a frozen screen there. So as you can see, they're able to throw that in a straight line, like high pressure moving to low pressure. But if we spin them, we're going to get them going relatively fast before they throw that thing. All right, now, Kate, try to throw the ball to Ben. Oh, oh, it's a little off center. All right, we'll just try it again. Ben, you can try this time. You see how the ball appears to be curving? Well, what it's actually doing is just landing in the place where it was intended, but the person catching it has moved from that position, okay? So it makes it challenging. All right, let's slow him down before Kate throws up here. All right, you can get off of there, and hopefully we can see a playback. Looks like we might be able to. Nope, that's, that's earlier. Fine. There's another video in there. I'm gonna let this off. All right, so Abby's going to try to play back the moment when the ball is thrown and then caught. There we go. You can see it, the ball occurs, appears to be going on a curved path, but that's just because the camera is rotating with this system like we look at the Earth. We're rotating with the Earth as well. And it looks like the ball's curving, but it's really going in a straight line. That's the Coriolis effect, and that's why tornadoes and hurricanes and storm systems on the Earth look like they're turning. So, all right, thanks, Ben and Kate. Kate, do you need a bucket? Do you need a bucket? Because you, you got a little sick? No, okay. She said yes, so. She can't speak right now because she's a little dizzy. All right, so that's the Coriolis effect. And, and our water has started to boil. Let's take a look at the water then. So you got to switch apps. Maybe you got to quit the GoPro app or something because it's not, there it goes. Look at that. Right? And what we want to see is that when it reaches the boiling point, which it has done, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to eventually level off at 100, and you'll see that. It started down here at zero, and it was zero until it changed to water, and then there was a little big mix of water and ice, and then it was a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, static incline until it, got, until it gets to 100. We'll see that in a few more minutes. All right, our, our last thing that we want to do is, is this the song? This is. All right, well, we have a song all about the water cycle. So let's take a look at what the water cycle is. And we're going to have a little setup. We've got a mountain. Right. So sometimes during the water cycle, water molecules that are in the air as water vapor will contract. Everybody get together. together. They'll contract and land on cooler things. And they'll, like cooler things like a mountain. You can see. There's evaporation because the sun heats up the water and expands those molecules. Give it some space. And then it goes all the way up into the upper atmosphere, into the sky, where there's cooler air that makes those molecules condense for condensation. What they do is they contract. That's right. And when we get heavy enough, they form, they get so close that they form liquid and collect into a big groups that can't stay in the sky any longer, and they fall back to the earth, and we call that precipitation. It could be rain, snow, hail, sleet, lots of different things. So we've got a little song about this called Riding the Water Cycle. Now, when I wrote this, I imagined 
what if I was on a bicycle riding on a water molecule? What, what would life be like? And this is what the song is, okay? Now I know you've heard about the unicycle and the motorcycle, even the bicycle and the tricycle, but have you ever heard about the water cycle? Well, one day I tried to ride my bike into the lake outside. I pedal my heart as I couldn't tread. The water rose above my head. I thought for sure I'd be dead. But the water cycle took me for a ride instead. Evaporation lifted me from that lake. Took me up to the clouds. But now I was joined by my evaporated friends when we were all too heavy. We started to sink. You see this green here? That's your part. So you're going to be like, hey, we need a drink when it comes to that, right? When we were all too heavy, we started to sink. The animals and the trees said, hey, we need a drink. So we opened up the clouds and out poured the rain. Precipitating over the mountains and the plains. Precipitation dumped me back to the ground. Plopped into the lake, I was sure to drown. I thought for sure that I'd be dead. But the water side took me for a ride instead. Then we repeat. If you learn it, sing along. Evaporation lifted me from that lake. Took me up to the cloud for goodness sake. teach you that are exciting. Thank you for listening. That's right. We do have some other things here. We're going to talk about some wild weather, extreme weather for segment two. Uh-oh. Which one? All right, so let's start with our first one. 
what is a rising overflow of water that submerges land, which is usually dry? Yell it out if you know. I hear it, I hear it, flood. That is correct, a flood. Let's look at an example here in real life. But floods occur in many other ways. Heavy rains and thawing snowfall can overwhelm rivers. Storm surges caused by hurricanes and tsunamis inundate the coastline. Landslides and mud flows can displace large volumes of water. Dams break, levees fail. All right, so you saw some examples of floods there, and that video shared that there are lots of different ways that floods happen. If dams or levees break, or the snow melts, or you have a large intensity of volume of rain that comes down in a short period of time, that all causes flooding. And floods occur in all 50 states. So it is one of the most common natural disasters here in the United States. And we are gonna look at a flood experiment. But first, I wanted to share something about flooding. But floods occur in many other... The next slide. The ancient Egyp Egyptians used flooding for their benefit. So the Nile River would flood, have a big flood once a year, and it was called the inundation. Everybody say inundation. Inundation. That's a big fancy word for a big flood. And it would soak all this dry land. And they had some ideas that they could use this big flood. So they dug these deep trenches and canals, and they used that for their irrigation systems to farm and have fertile soil land for the rest of the year. So today we're going to look at an example, and we are going to test out some different samples. So up here on the stage in this baby pool, I have aggregates and I have soil. Now aggregates, aggregates are things like uh, sand, concrete, pavement, all right? And then we have some dirt and soil. And we also have what we call ground cover, which are plants. So when the rain comes down in Ohio, it's falling on all these different kinds of surfaces. So here, this might be an example of a parking lot. Can I be the rain? Yep. Mr. Frank, go ahead and be the parking rain on our parking lot. lot. What do you notice? It just runs straight off. Can it soak up? No, it's not soaking up. All right. Well, here I have another example. This one looks like there's a lot of space here, and only the bottom is plugged up with our concrete. This might be like a drain, right? So we have lots of drains in our cities underneath, and it can handle a lot of water. But if it's coming down, we get flash flooding pretty quickly if it can't handle the amount that's coming down. And so eventually you can see it starts spilling over. Well, here we have some other surfaces. We have sand and we have soil. Let's rain on these surfaces. Take a look. Do you see it coming down the bottom? In our sand, we've got more space. The particles. Did they expand? I think they have expanded. <laughs> okay, they're not as condensed. They're not as compacted. We need more rain. And so the <laughs> rain is actually absorbing. This is the absorption right here. It's going down. All right. Where might we see a lot of sand? A beach. Yes. Okay. So then let's try our soil. Man, it's just not filling up. There it goes. All right. So it eventually did overflow. And yes, flooding does happen even when it's saturating the land. If the land has had too much water absorption and it can't go down into our, our ground uh, quickly enough, it will start to overflow. But you can see that there's absorption here too. So we know that the more soil, the more land that we have, it actually helps prevent flooding. All right, let's try our ground cover here. This is how I pour myself a glass of lemonade when it's hot. All right, you see the petals and the leaves? It's helping to deflect the rain and spread it around. And again, we are absorbing 
that into the soil. So this is something that scientists look at. They look at, okay, how is, uh, how is development impacting our soil and how might that increase flooding in a particular area? All right, I think we're ready for number two. Okay, number two. Guess that natural disaster. This is a big guess. <laughs> it's okay if it's not full screen. We can go. All right. What is the movement of a mass of rock, debris, or earth down a slope? Earthquake. I heard it. Landslide. Yes. A landslide. landslide Let's breeze. watch this example of a landslide uh, from 1993, I believe, in Oregon. Portland, Oregon, February 1996. A mountain begins to move, and for a contractor and his son, there's only one option. Get out of the way fast. about the difference in these landscapes. What do I got? One has a lot of trees and one doesn't. We call this deforestation. We need a lot of trees, right? We need it for a lot of materials. And so we cut down the forest. If we do that too much, it can start to impact our land. So what do you notice about trees? What do they have? Ah, roots. they have roots. Look at this. I tried this once with just plastic trees. What do you see the difference? They don't have roots. They're just little plastic pegs. So I had to get some real examples here of our trees. So the root structure helps ground these trees in here. And so we're going to see if it impacts our landscapes as we pour water down these slopes. All right, I need oh, two volunteers, volunteers, hopefully from the same family today. Same family. There's two in the back. Yeah. All right, in the back. Two of you from the back. Yeah, you too. Yes, That's you, good. yes. Yeah, sorry, just with the protocol, we need to make sure they're on the same family. Come on down. Look, they've got Science Saturday shirt. Yes, cool. They've been here Way before. Way to represent. What is There's your name? Keith. 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 And what's your name? Same. Say it again. Same. Same? All right. Come on up. And right. one of you, you're going to try to pour at the same rate at the same time. You're going to pour directly in the, down the center. And we're just going to take a look to see what happens with our experiment. All right, so let's take the cap off of here. Let's pick it up, put it right here. You ready? Oh, maybe let's let your brother come on in here. There we go. You ready? On your mark, get set, pour it. go, pour. Yeah. Pour straight pour down the middle. Location at about the same rate. Slow yours down a little bit. So you try to make them go about the same rate. There you go. And we've got another gallon once that one's over. It's just seeping into the gallon. Yep. Takes a while. Get yours pouring a little faster on this side. Yeah. There you go. All right, here, here's your next gallon. We found out it takes a lot of water to do this. Here you go. It just seeps into the gallon. So Any we're years? trying to see when, at what point it solidifies and becomes a liquid, and that mass starts to move. What do you expect to see? Anybody want to raise their hand and say what you expect? What's your prediction? Right here in the blue shirt. Uh -oh. Yeah, we'll see about that. 
Does anybody have a prediction about which one is going to happen first? All right, take a look at the begin. Take a look down here. You see it? Yeah. We've got a house that's moved. This water has moved down the hill. All right, take a look at this one. Our houses are intact. Look down here. The water rate has slowed down. It's still collecting down there, but it, it was slower. But it rate. didn't move the soil with it, which is really important for the. That's what the roots do. Okay, so let's take a look at geologists. Think. Let's thank our volunteers here for their help today. Here you go, gentlemen. You guys have something. Thank you for helping us today. We'll give them a stage pin. Congratulations. Now Good you job. might think, oh well, this is kind of cool to look at landslides to see what we can do about helping prevent landslides or helping people who are living in these areas where landslides occur. There are people who do that. They're scientists, they're called geologists. So maybe one day you would want to be a geologist. So this, uh, this guy here, he works out in Oregon. And so let's take a look at what some scientists are doing in Oregon where that landslide occurred. What if we could recreate a real landslide to learn how far and fast it'll go? In Oregon, Richard Iverson oversees experiments at the world's largest landslide flume, a 310-foot-long concrete chute. Here, the U.S. Geological Survey slops together truckloads of soil materials to track how they behave when water is added. Okay, so take a look. See this big flume? It's a big chute. And they put this, uh, the soil in here, and they use all these different probes in there, and they have sprinkler systems, and they look at the intensity of the rain, and they try to see when will it become a liquid mass that moves. All right, we're going to go on to number three. We're running down on time, so let's take a look at our next one. See if you can guess that natural disaster. What if we could recreate a real land? Okay, what is a narrow, violently rotating column of air that extends from a thunderstorm to the ground? Avocado! Ah, uh, I oh, heard it! Tornado! Sorry. We need three volunteers, hopefully from the same family. Three oh, volunteers. All right. Look, these, these guys in this row, like the fifth, sixth, fifth row there. These three what here. About those guys. Okay, Cub Scout shirts. They're all in Cub Scout shirts. You got Come a game today? Down. Is there a baseball game coming today for you guys? No, we're in Scouts. Oh, it's a Scouts thing. They look kind of like baseball shirts. All right, and what are your guys' names? My name is, My name is Ethan Alexander McCutcheon. Ah, wow. Right, the whole name. Miles. Miles. Miles, Ethan, and James? Yes. All cool. right. Okay, so I am going to actually ask um, you two. My, you, you guys are about the same. Okay, you're going to be here, you're going to be here. Now, on my count, you're going to rush each other and fight. This is what they do naturally at home, okay, right? You're ready? Okay, you're right. Set. Natural. Go. Environment. Ah. Oh. All right, all right. You can see who has the hoods. Man there. down, man down. That's good, that's good. Okay. That's a great representation. Okay, so go ahead and hold these. Hold these out for us. All right, so sometimes weather systems meet. Warm fronts meet cold fronts. High pressure meets low pressure, all right? And when a low pressure and a high pressure system meet, their winds patterns are spinning in different directions, multi-directional winds. And so we get some circulating areas of patterns. All right, so these are our circles. So we've met our air here. Warm air wants to do what? Remember when we had this boiling? Warm air is doing what? Evaporating. Yes, it's evaporating and it's? Expanding. Expanding. Yeah, expanding. And it's rising, it's rising. And what is the cooler air doing? Condensing. It's condensing, it's condensing, it's sinking, right? So we have Everybody all these things happening. Get together. Yep. And we have all these things happening as creating multi-directional winds. Well, sometimes when we get uh, cumulonimbus clouds from the collection, everything's condensing. Condensing. Where's my numula? Uh, there we go. I've got my cumulonimbus cloud. Everything's condensing, collecting together into a cloud. 
Well, we end up with an updraft. Where's my updraft? All right, come here, buddy. I need you. All right, call this a spin. Spin, fast, fast, fast. Spin, spin, spin. All right, good. All right, so now all of a sudden, those winds, the circular pattern of winds, have met the clouds and the earth, and we end up with a tornado. Now, does every supercell big thunderstorm create tornadoes? No. No, it's, uh, it's not as frequent that this happens, right? But some of our large cell systems do happen. And you know what? I think I feel an updraft here in the audience. Oh, get closer, get closer. Get closer. All the way up here, all the way up here. All the way up. All right, good job, good job. All right, good job. Thank you, volunteers, for being our lovely tornado parts. Good job. Okay. We've got one more to, dis to discuss here today. Let's take a look. And if you are curious, you can find a simulator online. We're not going to do that today. Oh, here's our tornado picture. <laughs> Having technical difficulties. There it is. Here's our tornado video. They're like, I don't want to be one of those cows that's in a thunderstorm, in a tornado. Aunt Mabel did that one time and she got really hurt. Now all that debris and stuff that's blowing like 90 or 100 miles an hour is really fast and dangerous. Okay, so you can find an online simulator like we did online and you can change the parameters to see if you can get an E5. Yeah, right here. So you can change the diameter, how wide it is, and you can also change your speed, and you can change it to see if you can get an EF1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which would be the greatest scale. We are not going to do that here today. All right, next one. Let's guess. What is a type of storm, sometimes called a tropical cyclone? Which forms over tropical or subtropical waters? I already heard it. It's a hurricane. And Mr. Frank talked about hurricanes in, in the first segment. Remember, we've got the Coriolis effect, so the Earth is rotating. And it takes how many hours to rotate one complete time? 24, 24 hours. hours, that's right. And at the equator, it's got a larger circumference than the poles. So this is actually, the equator is rotating slightly faster than the poles, which creates that pattern, that rounding circular pattern. So we are going in what direction in the northern hemisphere will things turn? Those storms. Count. Counter -clockwise. Counterclockwise. That's right, counterclockwise. And in the southern hemisphere it goes clockwise. So and by the way, it has nothing to do with the direction the toilets flush. Have you noticed? Have you heard that? The toilets in the, upper, in the northern hemisphere flush in a different direction than the southern hemisphere? Doesn't have anything to do with the Coriolis effect. Just uh. to demystify that. All right, so we end up with an eye. So remember, this warm air, this is going to be our ocean. This warm air is getting heated up by the sun. And so we've got this hot, warm ocean air right here. But above it is cooler air. And so it's evaporating, it's expanding, and then up here it's condensing, it's contracting, Body get together. and it's creating those cumulonimbus clouds. And sometimes we get these large cumulonimbus clouds and storms, and we create a hurricane. So here's my example hurricane. Notice I have this thing in the middle. Anybody know what it's called? It's the eye, right? The eye of the storm. The eye is actually really, really calm. And this right here is called the wall of the eye. The wall of the eye is actually the most dangerous part of the storm. And so there's low pressure in the center, just like our tornado. 
there's a low pressure area in the tornado. And so all the winds are wanting to go inside, but it's getting deflected. And so you start getting this swirling pattern. We are not going to do this today, but what I would like for you to do is I want you to get a bowl of water when you go home, and I want you to put some food coloring in the center, and I want you to turn it in a counterclockwise direction, and I want you to see if you can get a picture of the radar system like a hurricane. Watch out! A hurricane is coming toward you! Watch your own eye. Oh! We got the cameraman. All right, let's take a look at a real-life hurricane. Cyclone, typhoon, hurricane. All of these names are used around the world to describe the most powerful storm known to man. All right, so let's take a look. I think we have a picture. This hurricane here, see Hurricane Irma from 2017? Look how big it is in comparison to the state of Florida. Right up here, this peninsula is the state of Florida. These systems can get massive, much, much larger than, an, and than our state. Okay, so maybe you're thinking, hey, hurricanes, that sounds so cool. I might want to study hurricanes one day. Well, guess what? You could be a director at a university lab like this guy, and he actually simulates hurricane storms at ground level to see what we can do as a society to help prevent devastation. Good morning. This tank gives scientists and the rest of us a view no one has ever had before. What a hurricane's power looks like at water level as it storms ashore. In just two minutes, scientists here can take calm waters and turn them into a monster hurricane. The wind is gradually getting stronger and stronger as, it, as it's coming up here and it's ramping up to a category five. It's probably about a category three right now. This 75-foot-long tank is the first simulator in the world capable of creating a Category 5. All right, so it's, that simulator can simulate cate Category 5 winds and waters at ground level. Okay, you know what? I think we should turn the show over to someone who knows way more about weather than we do, Mr. Frank or I. And this man is a meteorologist. His name is Mr. Mike Joyce. Let's welcome Mr. Joyce up onto the stage today. Thank you. Hey, guys. Happy Saturday. How's everyone doing? Good. Um, I'm happy to be here for Science Saturdays. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about some of the tools that I use in my job and share a little bit about what I have seen um, as a meteorologist, and that's just a big fancy word for somebody who studies and predicts the weather. Give me one second. I'm going to grab a couple tools that I have for predicting the weather. Uh, one of them is this little thing right here. So we'll start off with this one. This one uh, kind of looks like a, a little laser pointer thing. Right? This one right here kind of looks like a water one. Basically, what it is is it's a thermometer. Um, but let's share a little bit about me and why I'm here today. So I uh, used to work here on TV in Dayton. Uh, I still kind of do, but not uh, uh, very frequently anymore because I am currently going back to school myself to become a science teacher. So I did meteorology full-time, and now I'm going to do that part-time and then become a teacher full-time. So this is kind of an exciting day for me. Uh, to be here. So um, we'll get that PowerPoint going in here in just a second, but I'm going to share with you some of the uh, tools that we use um, in the meteorology field to not only figure out what's going to go on today, but hopefully figure out what is going to happen as we go throughout the week. Because if you think about it on Monday, you might want to know what's going to be happening on Saturday, right? You have plans. You might have soccer practice, football, uh, anything outside, and you kind of want to know what's going on. Um, let's move on to the next slide, if we can. So we'll go on to the next one, because we're going to talk about our first major tool. And we already saw a demonstration about rising air, right? We saw the hot air balloon demonstration with the toaster. Well, the weather balloon uses another property. 
and the weather balloon is very, very important. So what this guy is doing, he works for the National Weather Service, and they're responsible for, if you've ever heard a tornado warning before or a winter storm warning, they're responsible for making that happen so we can tell everyone about it. Well, anyway, he's also responsible for strapping this white box to a giant balloon. I mean, you can see how big it is compared to his body. And that orange thing is a parachute. And what's going to happen is they're going to send that weather balloon up. They do it twice a day. And locally, they do it down in Wilmington, Ohio, so about 30 miles from here. And what they do uh, at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day, they launch these massive balloons into the sky. And as you rise in the atmosphere, the pressure decreases, so the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it expands, and then it goes to the edge of space, and then it explodes. And then that little orange parachute attached to it lets the weather instrument safely float back to Earth. And sometimes that weather instrument will land 100 miles away or so where it landed, depending on how fast the wind is blowing that day. So if something launched here near Dayton, it could end up near Pittsburgh when it falls to the surface, and that's pretty common. So now what we're going to do is, if you wouldn't mind showing that YouTube video right there, we're going to watch a National Weather Service meteorologist launch the balloon because it's a pretty cool thing to see. Um, more efficiently where the balloon is going to take the radiothon. So as you can see, since we have a south wind, we're pointing the antenna northwest. So right now we will go outside and release the balloon and we'll see you out there. back to the PowerPoint now. But so now we are going to see what what all that data, all those graphs that she was tracking. On the next couple of slides, we're going to see what that means um, right here. So this looks like a lot of complicated stuff. This is, we've got a graph here, we've got another graph, we've got a bunch of numbers down here. What's really important about this is that instrument box can give us so much, and it can tell us so much about what's going on. So basically, it can tell us if it's going to be a tornado day or not. If we didn't have weather balloons, it would be so difficult, if not impossible, to know when severe weather days might happen, because we need to know what's going on all the way up to space. And the weather balloon helps us do that, and we plot it all in the chart. We plot the wind direction, we plot the temperature, the humidity, and then a bunch of computers make a lot of calculations and then give us a bunch of numbers that we have to know. So on the next slide, we will talk about another thing that's really important about weather balloons. Anyone know what freezing rain is? Isn't it kind of gross and probably the worst thing ever in the wintertime? Unless you're looking for a snow day, then it'll give you that, which is great. But so... What, what happens when you have freezing rain is, normally when you go up in the atmosphere, the atmosphere cools down. It gets colder as you go up. But in the case of freezing rain, it actually gets warmer. There's a layer of warm air above freezing above our heads, about 1,000 feet or so. But at the surface, it's freezing, zero degrees, like we saw with our ice experiment. So what happens is it falls as rain, but because the ground is below freezing, it instantly freezes. And on our next slide, we have an example of what can go really, really wrong when you have a freezing rain event. And it's, it's not pretty. We've had a few of these nasty events here in the Dayton area. Um, let's see, is, is it, is, do we have that picture? Oh, there it is. Awesome. Well, not awesome. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't look very good, does it? So this is actually a picture. I don't know. It's somewhere in Ohio. This was back in 2005, I think. There was a really nasty freezing rainstorm. And it not, it could, you can look at all the power lines and all the trees. It could knock power out for a week. But the weather balloon helps us know when a day like this is coming so we can prepare. So the next thing that's a big tool for us is NEXRAD radar. And what NEXRAD means is it means next generation radar. And really, it's been around for over 30 years. But it's a big golf ball looking tower, and it has an antenna inside the golf ball looking thing. And that antenna on the next slide will tell us what it can do. So, radar is basically an antenna that 
moves around and around. It spins in 360 degrees, scanning the atmosphere all day, every day, all year, 365, 24 hours a day. But what it does is it helps us find out, find out where the rain is falling, if that rain or precipitation might be snow or sleet or freezing rain, and it lets us know how hard it's raining. It can also tell us what di which direction the wind is going. And that's how we figure out where tornadoes are. The weather balloon helps us figure out if it could be a tornado day. The radar helps us figure out if a tornado is happening now. So we have a couple images here. This is the radar in wind mode. That's the radar in rain mode. In wind mode, the red and the green are the different wind directions. And in rain mode, the red and the green, red is heavy, green is light. So you have to kind of know the difference, but those are such powerful tools. Not only that, but when you have freezing rain, it really helps to know the surface temperature. So that's why you would use your thermometer there. And then on the next slide, we have an example. I wish the video would play. We tried it earlier. But a couple, about five years ago, there was an incident at the Dayton uh, Air Show, where it was the day before they were starting to practice. And then a plane flipped over. It was just sitting on the runway, and it flipped over. So what happened was, we could see on radar what happened. A big gust of wind came through, straight line wind, which means it's one big gust of wind all in one direction. And the airport's right here near Vandalia on the map. Oops. And then the green changed to red right near the airport. That means the wind changed 180 degrees. It changed direction like the snap of a finger. And it was powerful enough to flip a plane over. So I thought that was a pretty interesting example of how radar works. But then on the next slide, we have another very important tool, a wind vane. It's pretty simple. Tells us which way the wind is blowing. And then those three cups, that little fan looking thing is called an anemometer. That's a big fancy word for thing that tells us which or how fast the wind is blowing. And I actually have a handheld one right here. This is something you would use out in the field if you were trying to measure the wind. So you would have to figure out which way the wind is coming yourself. But then you would turn it on and the little fan inside, see if I move, it can kind of see the fan blowing. So it counts how many times it spins and that lets you know how fast the wind is blowing. And that one's a, a fancy one. So now another part of being a meteorologist is spotting storms, or you might have heard of the term storm chaser. Most of the time it's researchers doing it, or, or in the case of TV, doing it so we can put uh, images on TV. So if there's a tornado, we can show you where the tornado is so you're more likely to react and go to your safe spot in your house. But what do you need to spot storms? And on the next slide, there is something that um, all of us really should have. How are we on time? Two minutes? OK. Uh, NOAA weather radio. Does anyone have a weather radio at their house? Not too many. These are not very expensive. They're probably about 20 to $30. You can get them at any drugstore. And basically what it is is you can program it so that if it's the middle of the night and you have your phone on silent when you're sleeping, this can alert you if there's a tornado warning at 3 in the morning. So it's really important to have something like this so that you know when a tornado might be coming overnight. And then on the next slide, uh, when we're out in the field, we have the radar on our iPads. So we need mobile data, like a cell phone, to do it. iPad helps us out there. Or on the next slide, we can use a laptop. The laptop gives us both the wind and the uh, rain radar at the same time, which is kind of nice. And then another tool that we use out in the field is pretty cool. You might have this in your car, too. It's called a power inverter. And what that does is it takes the power outlet in your car and turns it into a house outlet. So when that happens, you can plug a bunch of stuff in, and that includes a GoPro cam. We saw the GoPro cam earlier with the Coriolis effect. Well, that one we could actually strap to the top of the car and get some video of what we're doing. And that video can be used for research. Um, back in 1974, when the tornado hit Xenia, the fact that a 16-year-old high school student at Xenia, uh, I think his name was Bruce Boyd, he uh, had a, like a old film camera, and he caught the tornado. Just because he did that, advanced meteorology a ton. Because Dr. Fujita, the the founder of the F scale, the F one, like the F zero, F one, F two, F three, F four, F five, he used that video to figure out how tornadoes work. And it was just a high school kid that thought he could film it, and he did a wonder for science just by doing that. Um, so that's all I really have, other than one last thing. So when you're chasing, you have to have a car that can drive 
oh, I don't know, 4,000 miles over four days. Because storm chasing is driving and driving and driving and more driving and sitting and waiting. So our next slide is us waiting. So we just had a football there to toss around to kill the time. We're just on our phones. And then one last point here. It's hot when you're out there. 105 degrees at 354 in the afternoon in May. That's, that's too hot. Uh, but this is what you'll see. Uh, Moore, Oklahoma. This is a famous tornado on May 20th, 2013. So this is what it looked like right off the bat. Funnel, pretty typical. But then on the next slide, that's what it looked like two minutes later. So it went from about an EF2 to an EF5 in like two minutes. That is how fast tornadoes can develop and be the monsters and the destruction that they can be. And I think I'm going to stop it there just because I'm running out of time. But I really want to thank everybody for inviting me to speak to you guys on Science Saturdays. This is a super awesome event. Again, I am uh, kind of working in TV part-time these days. I'm transitioning into teaching, so this is a wonderful experience for me, and I hope I can uh, come back and see you all again. Definitely. Thanks Let's so thank uh, Mr. Thank Joyce, our meteorologist. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And hey, if you are interested in more science, you should follow us on Facebook and Twitter at ScienceSat, and we make updates periodically. We'd like to thank the following people. We are sponsored this year by the Department of Defense STEM. That's a new sponsor for us. We're happy to have them. Montgomery County ESC, Engineering Science Foundation, Engineers Club of Dayton, where um, Charles Kettering and Edward Deeds put on a science show here in the early 1900s, and we're just revamping that. It was a lot of fun. And of course, Mike Joyce, meteorologist. If you've got questions for him, or you'll be around after the show. Oh, I'll stick around for a little bit, yeah. He'll stick around. You can, you can approach him after the show if you've got more questions. We just had so much in this show, we had to cut some things out. But uh, we hope that you got a lot of good weather knowledge out of it. We're going to sing it out. Yeah, and, and then afterward, we will do our t-shirt. Well, then we got a t-shirt. All right. Our next show is on November 13th. It's about two months from now. Make sure that you mark your calendars. It'll be right here at the Engineers Club. Uh, uh, it's so long as COVID allows us to do it. And uh, it's going to be all about the brain. All sorts of things we have in store for you. Behavior and that sort of thing. All right. So Your ticket number, if you are here, 9132929132929. That's our ticket number. Right, right here. 91329. Okay, great. Come on down. She's smart and strong according to her t-shirt. All right, you can take this down and exchange it for whatever size you need. Just make sure you have those tickets. All right, great. Well, thank you again. We'll see you November 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, sure.